And so all day long, you're in a small indoor environment, you're using those muscles a little bit. Mm -hmm. Now as an adult, your eyes have largely stopped growing. And so you're not likely to develop nearsightedness now, but for a young kid whose body's still growing and developing. They have implemented in some countries like uh, I think Indonesia, they've recommended, hey, uh, all kids have to spend at least two hours a day out playing outside in the sunlight. Uh, awesome. <laughs> and so once they started implementing that, the rates of nearsightedness, nearsightedness development for kids have also gone down. Wow. And so uh, you know, these are usually still small studies, so there still needs to be a lot more done. But uh, So I always encourage even to, to parents, uh, when their kids aren't nearsighted, I'm like, encourage them to take breaks when they're spending a lot of time on new yes. devices or studying school, but then get them outside. You know, <laughs> you want them to spend a little more time outside uh, just from, there's something about that. You know, I, I was telling you, I've, I've never had vision problems before in my life, which I'm very grateful for. However, I did notice the first three and a half years when I was building this thing, I was at my parents' house. They lived back in the woods. And I mm -hmm. my studio and my office were the same exact thing. So it was a blacked out studio like this with fluorescent lights. Not as nice as this one, but actually yeah. way worse, right in your face. And so now you see all my, you saw my place out here, like where I work. There's natural light everywhere. I go outside mm -hmm. all the time. But I was like banged up during those three and a half years too, health-wise. So I was inside all the time. And like I never had the effect of like, oh, I can't read some or I can't see that sign. But I had what I would call like eye fatigue yeah. all the fucking time. And I noticed maybe about – probably about a year after moving up here because I don't – when I'm recording in here, I'm in here. But – you know, I'm not in here besides that. I'm outside a lot. I go for walks all the time. Good. I notice like that eye fatigue kind of thing, like almost like haziness is sure. totally gone. And Good. I think, you know, it's pretty obvious why. Yeah. So there, there is a something that's not, I don't think it's discussed very much, but there is something called proximal accommodation. And so again, accommodation is the process of flexing that muscle inside okay. the eye. And so when you are indoors, anything that's less than 20 feet away, because uh, 20 feet beyond that is considered optical infinity for the human eye. Uh, you are technically f using your eye muscles just a little bit to focus on a near object. So even right now, looking at you and you're only like, what, five feet away, I know I'm using my eye muscles just a little bit. Versus if I try to imagine I'm looking at the Empire State Building super right. far away, I can relax my muscles and my eyes deviate. Look right there. Yeah, there but go. yeah, there we go, yeah. <laughs> but even that, uh, yeah, I'm still using my accommodation just a little bit to even see that wall that's, you know, maybe 10, 12 feet away. Yeah. Hey, guys, if you haven't already subscribed, please hit that subscribe button. It's a huge, huge help. Thank you. And so all day long, you're in a small indoor environment, you're using those muscles a little bit. Mm -hmm. Now, as an adult, your eyes have largely stopped growing. And so you're not likely to develop nearsightedness now. But for a young kid whose body's still growing and developing, they may have an increased likelihood of their eye wanting to stay in that state and the eye responds by growing longer right. so that they don't have to use those muscles as strong. So my like what I described as like eye fatigue would be more like shock to the system in a way because I'm not out there in that kind of environment all the time but my eye hasn't changed because it, I was already an adult and it had grown to its size. Right. So essentially what you were doing is going to the gym and lifting up a two pound weight off the dumbbell rack and just holding it there. Mm. at halfway contracted all day long for several days at a time. And you can do it. It's a light weight, no problem. But you eventually feel some fatigue. Oh, yeah. Right? So then you go outside and you put that weight down. Yeah. And it, that's that's that's, that's the it. eye strain that people are often experiencing, multiplied by the fact that when we're on screens, we don't blink as often and we don't blink as completely. Your eyes tend to not close all the way mm. when you're staring at a screen. We're like, as, as a species, we tend to like hyper fixate. It's, <laughs> it's like we're, um, our attention span is, is way more like grabbed on the screens than it is if we're just reading like a casual book. What, why is that? I don't think they fully understand it yet. Uh, they don't know if it's because of the light, is it because of the kind of the depth of it? Is it, uh, so there is something there they haven't fully understood, but they know that part of it is the f the amount of focus or the attention that we're giving to it. The, because um, with books, if it's just a leisure book, like you're just 
you know, reading Lord of the Rings or something like that, we tend to have more closer to normal blink rates. Mm. But when we're studying like chemistry or calculus or something like that, and we're really focused on it, then our blink rates often again diminish and you don't blink as much. Have they studied that comparison? Like you're talking about phones versus books in that way. Have they studied phones versus Kindles when you're reading a book or something that's actually a screen with a light behind it? Right, they have. Uh, and they, there is differences. Um, the, they do know that depending on the device used, usually people don't hyper fixate, fixate it as much on the Kindles uh, versus like a normal iPad mm. or, or other type of tablet. There is something really nice about that kind of cool um, contrast, that kind of cool gray color that Kindles have. I, I do really like that. Mm. It's kind of softer. So there is some benefit to that versus the harsh, like bright right. screen boosted contrast look. Um, but still, I, I do believe still just regular paperback is people are usually more leisure with a classic paperback. To, to jump back for one sec, I yeah. had this question, but we got off it. You know, what are, we talk about red light therapy all the time. Like mm -hmm. I use it on my hair and seems oh, to sure. work like doctors like that, but what, it's used for so many different things. W what is it about the red light itself scientifically that makes it such this like potential elixir of health? Yeah, so I know I've heard some of your previous guests uh, talk about mitochondria. Right, uh, and really, that's <laughs> you know, we kind of laugh for a second. We're like, everybody's using this as like a buzzword now, um, but that that's essentially kind of where it falls down onto. Mm. Now, in the eye care space, there is red light, which is around six hundred thirty up to like six hundred seventy nanometers of light, but they they find that devices that also use near infrared light, so closer to eight hundred fifty nanometers, and sometimes even a little bit less than that. It's kind of a yellow orange light, mm. five hundred ninety nanometers of light, also have benefits, and they don't fully understand exactly how it's working, but it does when the light energy. So that's the thing. It's wavelength of light has one role, but then also the amount of energy given to a tissue mm. will stimulate uh, cells within the within the tissue, like the mitochondria, which produces ATP. It is the you know fifth grade energy of the the powerhouse of the cell. Mm. but it it energizes it, allows it to make more energy. but then it also changes some uh, protein productions within the nucleus of the cell. Mm. So it kind of, for cells that are like aging and dying, they're getting tired, they're not making proteins efficiently, by giving this ener light energy, it reopens their energy production and helps it live a little bit longer at a higher efficiency capacity. That's that's kind of the way I think it's about like it. It's like an energizer. It's like the energizer bundle, yeah. like a battery pack. And, and so, the, they have shown, at least for the eyes now, if we think about just the eyes, because I'm not a specialist in, in other forms of health, because they've been studying red light since the 60s, mm. uh, and they're trying to better understand it. I have a whole lecture on this for- It wasn't for part of MK Ultra, was it? I don't know what that is. What is MK Ultra? You know what? Good for you. Keep <laughs> going. Don't worry about it. <laughs> um, <laughs> so right now, in the field of eye care, they're studying red light therapy for not just myopia, like we mentioned earlier, but they've been studying it for dry eye, uh, along with other forms of anterior segment disease like chalazia, styes, things like that. But they're also studying it for macular degeneration. Mm. Uh, in fact, that it's been FDA approved. One device has been FDA approved for the treatment of macular degeneration. It's been used in, in Europe for a little bit longer. But that uses not just red light, but it uses near-infrared light and some yellow-orange light. Mm. And what's... Again, what I like to emphasize for people, because I think a lot of people hearing this, and I've done some videos on it, they think, I'm just going to go online, I'm going to go to Amazon, I'm going to buy this device, and I'm just going to stare at it, and it's going to help me see better. No, 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 no. Uh, <laughs> the the challenge is that it's there is a, a curve to it where if you don't get enough of the right energy, uh, you won't have the benefits mm. of the cells being activated. But you also can overshoot it if you have too much application. Then you're like those kids in the myopia study who had damage to the retina. Right. Uh, and so there is like this, uh, a sweet spot that you need to hit. And unfortunately, from all the research I've read, there, they don't seem to have a clear cut answer yet of where that lies. 
there are some protocols with some devices that have been tested and tested and tested. And those protocols with that specific device using that specific wavelength, they've seemed to gotten close to where they see positive benefits. But even them, they're like, you can't use this every day. <laughs> you have right. to, you know, you can only do this three times a week for three weeks and then you have to take a six month break. Uh, and so they're, there, there is a chance that people could overdo something. Right. So it's very much in development. They know there's something there. It's yeah. just a matter of like actually perfecting and getting more research. And people will ask, can't I just go outside? Because the sunlight has red light, near mm -hmm. infrared light. And you certainly can to some extent. There was a study in the 80s. Uh, and actually another doctor, uh, Mark Bullimore, sent me this one because he saw my lecture. And it was from the 80s. And they studied, yeah, specifically around 600 nanometers of light. If you close your eyes, sunlight you see that orange glow, that is actually 600 nanometers of light plus penetrating through your eyelids. Wow. And so there, there is some pot potential benefits of just being outside. But again, same thing. There's so much variability. What, what time of the year is it? What's the cloud cover like? Uh, you know, what part of the world are you living in? Are you, are you near the equator? Are you near the North Pole? All of those variables. So we haven't quite figured out where, where the sweet spot is. They mm -hmm. have the benefits. But there, there might be something to it. Um, and certainly we have devices in the eye clinics now that uh, have scientific validity and protocols that are showing positive benefits for things like dry eye, for styes on the eyelid. Uh, what are some of those devices? Yeah, so um, a couple of the brands, uh, MD Elite is one that has some red light. Another one is uh, Optometric Aesthetics. They sell a similar one. Um, the Valida light system is the one that's been FDA approved. Uh, the big company called Alcon just bought it. The um, the one for the pediatric myopia studies, I don't I don't remember off the top of my head what the name of that is. But so doctors have access to these devices that have more protocols that are I would deem are, are more safe mm. for people just buying stuff online. It's yeah, you gotta be I, I with that. wish there, there's a couple of devices that are cleared like in Canada. Um, yeah, <laughs> that you get all sorts of different images and things that come up. Um, in Canada, there is one called the Aruna Light, which you can buy. It's cleared for marketing. People can buy it online. I have two of them. I've sort of tested them. Uh, the challenge that I have is while it's based off of research that it may be positive benefit, the, the one thing that I've, has kept me from really, and this is the disclaimer, is that they don't have any specific clinical studies using that device. Mm, yeah. And so... That is like, so I'm kind of testing it out on myself, but I also have no benchmark of way to say that it's actually having any benefit. Mm. Other than the fact that it feels good. <laughs> you know, yeah. So it may be so just it could totally, be the placebo it could be very much be placebo. And so that's a, that's a big thing for me when it comes to posting stuff online. I try to be very clear about where the science is mm. and where it's kind of speculation. That's um, important. That's important these days. There's a lot of noise out there, yeah. you know? Um, but back to what you said, uh, I think earlier you kind of said like, what are things people can do to help mm -hmm. their eyes? Yeah. You were given like the pencil drill. Yeah. Yeah. There's day. that, uh, you know, the, the better things for the health of the eye, sunglasses still, I, if it's a high UV light day between 10 and 4 PM in the day, still good idea to wear sunglasses or wear a wide brim hat at the very least. Polarized. Um, that's totally up to you for glare protection. Okay. Uh, if, if you're bothered by glare, if you get headaches, if you're going to be on the water, I think polarized polarized glasses are amazing. Um, I have some videos on those, uh, but it really cuts down the glare. The UV light is just gonna slow down photo aging of the skin. The eyelids are the most thinnest skin on the body, right? Mm. So that'll help diminish any of the wrinkles and uh, eye bags from forming and things like that. Uh, but also it's gonna diminish sunlight damage to the surface of the eye. It'll slow down some level of cataract development. Um, so there's benefits to wearing sunglasses. The other big health thing is eating really healthy. Mm -hmm. uh, and even if you want to take some supplements, I'm a big fan of some of the research in, into some supplements for the eye. Oh, I want to talk about this. Can I just go to the bathroom real fast? Oh, yeah, do it. Real quick. And then we'll get into, we're going to go through dietary things and supplements as well. Yeah, yeah. I want to get into all that. Right back. Yeah. And we still have to hit blue light at some point. Oh, yeah. That's, that's about that. <laughs> All right, we're back. Thank you guys for watching the episode. If you haven't already, please hit that subscribe button and smash that like button on the video. They're both a huge, huge help. And if you would like to follow me on Instagram and X, those links are in my description below.